Buenos días. Wow, oh, así ya oí español. I'm so thrilled to be here in Texas. Every time I come to Texas, I feel like I have to speak Spanish um, for all my Mexican-American friends, my Puerto Rican friends who are moving in droves to Texas. Um, and I hope that there are some of you here, Puerto Ricano en la casa. Buena, epa, huepa. <laughs> I am um, just so grateful to be able to speak to you this morning because the power of possibility, that's me. <laughs> This is a child who was born in Puerto Rico with parents who were not very happy with one another, parents who nevertheless <laughs> managed to make seven children before they decided they really couldn't handle it anymore. My mother takes me and my six sisters and brothers from a rural part of Puerto Rico where we had lived with no electricity, no running water, no connections outside of the barrio that we lived in, I felt that I was becoming a jibara when I was growing up. That is a rural woman of Puerto Rico. At 13 years of age, everything changes in my life. My mother takes me to, not just to the United States. Texas would have been nice because of the long, long horizons. <laughs> I end up in Brooklyn where I would come outside of our apartment building and there would be a wall before me, no horizons. It was actually a labyrinth and that's what it felt like to me. I had, um, arrived at a place where I did not speak the language, where I didn't know how to dress for the climate. I had no idea um, about what a 13-year-old girl needs to uh, behave like because I knew that there were expectations. There were expectations at home, of course. There are expectations outside. I knew that, but I didn't know what those expectations were. I didn't know how to, how to tell where places are because in Macum, where I grew up, you know, you walk down the road unpaved and there would be an aguacate tree, the avocado tree, and that's Doña Juana. And over there is, you take a left and you go to the little schoolyard and under the shade of a mango tree. Well, in Brooklyn, I could not find my way because I didn't know how to tell where I was. The signs were in a language I didn't understand. My mother, bless, bless her soul, <laughs> whom I love very much, is still 84, who is 84 years old and whom I talk to frequently and who still cannot accept how difficult this was for her children but is very much aware of how difficult it was for her. Because after she came to New York, she was married again and she had four other children and so there were 11 of us. And so raising 11 children was a big deal. Yes, mommy, I got it. <laughs> I know that was hard. <laughs> but I was a 13-year-old girl who was ambitious. And because I was ambitious, I needed to do something with it. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do with your ambition when you are who I was? I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what it was. I liked to dance, and so I would just dance. But I wasn't good enough to be Suzanne Farrell with the uh, American Ballet Theater. I went to a, a high school that decided I was a good enough actress and, they, and I hung in there for three years playing Cleopatra for three years because I had such a heavy accent that there was no way I was gonna play Tennessee Williams or Eugene O'Neill. 
<laughs> they just said, no, nah, that's not going to happen. But Cleopatra, they could manage. And I would take the train from Brooklyn to Manhattan, where my school was. And every day, I would sit in that subway, and I would look at everyone there. And I saw everyone was going somewhere. And I didn't know where I was going. I knew I wanted to go somewhere too, but I didn't know where that was. I remember looking around me and trying to understand what do I need to do to become somebody that I am proud of, that I am proud of. Because the messages that I was getting were that I was a Puerto Rican girl, we were on welfare, 11 children around, single mother, poor, I didn't have the right clothes, I didn't speak Spanish, English very well, but a big, big dreams, but I didn't know how to make them happen. So this was all nothing but negative messages coming in this direction. It was like constant a sense of arrows coming in this direction, and I just wanted to deflect them some way. And the way that I did that was to build a, an invisible wall around myself so that all those little things would just bounce off so that I could be in a still place, in a quiet place where I can be with my thoughts, where I could not hear my 10 sisters and brothers my mother crying a lot, <laughs> my alcoholic grandmother, who was very funny, but really non-functional, and the messages I was getting from the outside world. I was a reader. I would go to the library, no Puerto Ricans, no books about Puerto Ricans, no books about people like me, an ambitious girl dreaming of something that she couldn't grasp because she didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. All I knew was that I wanted something. I was artistic. I was a, I was a challenge to my mother. I was difficult <laughs> for my friends because, you know, what's here comes out of here and there's like, there's no filter. I was not the easiest person to get along with. And because I was so ambitious, and at the same time, the expectations were so low, I was constantly fighting myself and fighting everyone around me in different ways. Never, I nev it never occurred to me to hurt myself. That, that's one thing that many years later, as I became a writer and I began to write about my life, I realized, you know, somehow that never occurred to me. It was one of these things like, no, I am going to live and make it miserable for everyone who's made me unhappy. <laughs> so it was never this attitude like I couldn't do something. I just didn't know what it was. Um, so I continued to try different things, always looking, you know, I'd be a secretary, but if I was a secretary, I was the best secretary everyone ever had. You know, then I was a medical transcriptionist. Oh boy, the doctors in the hospital where I worked, they loved me because I was just really good at transcriptions. And everything that I did, I became an Indian classical dancer for 17 years. I was a really good Indian classical dancer, probably the only Puerto Rican Indian classical dancer you've ever seen. <laughs> and I, and life, life kept moving, and it kept rolling, and I kept doing things, and I kept dreaming, and I kept expecting that moment when something would say, this is it, this is it, this is the thing that you are meant to do the rest of your life. And it happened at 3 in the morning when I was 34, 35 years old, nursing my child, <laughs> my first child. As I'm watching this little kid, just days old, 
and I looked at him and I said, he will never know his mother because she doesn't know who she is. She, she knows she's Puerto Rican, she knows she's, she's this particular age, she's done all these things, but she's not any of those things. Who is she? And that moment was my epiphany moment. It was the moment when I realized I have to tell this child who his mother is. I have to create the person that is going to raise this child. Creation is something that we sometimes throw it out there. We think in terms of, oh, I'm not creative. I, he I hear this all the time. I say, everybody's creative. We are constantly creating ourselves in our image. Or if we are not thinking about that, we are creating ourselves in the image of other people's perceptions. And I realized that moment with my child that one of the things I had done was to constantly deflect the negative perceptions about who I was and who I should become and who, who I should be because I would not accept that. I wanted to be this person. And that moment, I began to create Esmeralda Santiago, as you see, as you see her. Who is that person? Somebody who thinks about her life and who tries to constantly find a way to make that life a work of art. A work of art because that is the one thing that I can control as a creative person, and we all are creative persons. I can make a decision about the way I present myself to you. You can receive it any way that you want to receive it. Perhaps some of you liked that I spoke Spanish when I came in here. Some of you are like, we're in Texas, <laughs> speak English. I know, you know, this happens. But it doesn't matter. I am bringing to you the person that I have created for myself, the person that I can live with, the person that my children can look to and know and know who that person is. I'm someone who is involved in my life, someone who is interested in the history of my island. I have written a novel about it. In the process of 10 years of writing about Conquistadora, I learned something that I had been going towards my entire life, and that was history does not happen History does not happen. We make it happen. And we make it happen by those decisions, by creating who we are. What do we want to do with our lives? What do we want to present to an outside world? How do we receive those perceptions? And what do we do with them? Is it the power of impossibility that we are willing to accept? People like me constantly, constantly heard the power of impossibility for people like me. I knew it. I cried. I was angry. I did all kinds of things. But I always knew that there was possibility. And I knew that there was possibility if I believed it, and if I made it happen. Yes, Mr. Bodine mentioned the person you, sit, you stand next to you. I have been very, very fortunate in my life that there have been people who have supported me, who have mentored me, who have stood by me, and I am grateful. But remember, at the end of the day, when I lay down to think about what has happened, I remember this thing. I made this day happen. I made it happen because I am creating my own life. 
And I hope that as you go out today, you begin to think that this is the beginning of your creation of the rest of your lives. Thank you.